Aloha. Aloha. We welcome you here, this sanctuary, as well as online. On behalf of Pastor J.D. Farag, I would like to welcome you to our Thursday night Bible study. And uh, I pray that you'll join us Tuesday, um, July 5th at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. As we'll, leave, we'll, we'll be praying for, for those online and as well as those here in the church. Pastor J.D. is on a much-needed staycation. He's spending quality time with his family today. Please keep him and his family in prayer always. Tonight, I'll be teaching in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. I've entitled this message, How to Walk. But before we start, let's pray. Father, we come before your throne today. And we lift up this time that you have made that you would teach us your word, Lord. You would lead us and guide us, Lord, in how it is that we should walk with you, Lord. Help us to apply that which we learned tonight, Lord, into our lives. Again, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would just teach us, lead us and guide us tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the year 2000, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I started attending Calvary Chapel, Honolulu, Bill Stonebreaker was my pastor then. At the time, we met at the old Empress Theater, and it was in downtown Honolulu. Every year, our church would put on a Christian conference. It was called How to Walk. Some of you remember that. I went for the first time the year I got saved. I also volunteered to serve at this event. I was being held, it was being held at the Sheraton Waikiki Hotel. Pastor Chuck Smith, Greg Laurie, and Raul Reese were featured speakers. At this, my first conference, I got to see and meet Pastor Chuck Smith. He was still, and is, he is, and is still a beloved man. He's at home with the Lord now, but God used him in a mighty way while he was on earth. He started the first Calvary Chapel. He started in Costa Mesa in LA. Today, there are over 2,000 Calvary chapels all over the world. <clears throat> As I was on a de security detail, I just got to say hi to him, and it was so good because I had listened to him on K-Light Radio for so long. My wife, Jeannie, got to meet him as well. He went to um, lunch at the Sheraton Waikiki where my wife was working. Ephesians chapter 5, it's an amazing chapter. Paul the Apostle wants to encourage, encourage us, and he wants to teach us. He wants to teach us how to walk with Jesus. In verses 1 through 7, how we should walk in love. In verses 8 through 14, how we should walk in God's light and not in darkness. In verses 15 to 20, how we should walk in wisdom. Paul writes this letter while he's in prison in Rome. The time is... the time is uh, AD 60. Jesus had been crucified about 30 years earlier. The church is growing and is stead has rap the church is rapidly growing, excuse me. Christians are being persecuted for their faith, but God is on the throne and he sees. Christians are known as the Bible, the bride of Christ. Jesus, he's our bridegroom. He gave his life so that we could be saved. One day we'll join our savior and we'll all be in heaven with him for eternity. In Revelation 19, we look forward to the wedding supper of the Lamb, where our wedding to the Lamb will be cons consummated. But until then, we the bride, his church, like a fiancé in her engagement, stays faithful. As we the bride of Christ wait, we remain faithful to the Lord. We remain faithful in how we walk with him, Remain faithful in how we love, and remain faithful in how we live. The Holy Spirit leads us. He shows us the way that we should go. Let's look at the word sanctified. It means to be set apart for God's use. When we're born again, the Holy Spirit comes in and he seals us. That means we're under new ownership. We belong now to the Lord Jesus. The Lord starts making changes in us. 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us, 
but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. God has separated our minds and our hearts, separated us from the things of the world. Our minds and our hearts are drastically changed. God is renewing our minds, are being transformed into the image of God, not his divinity, but his image, his love, and his character. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23 tells us, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God is working by his spirit, and he's making us more like his son. Second Corinthians chapter eight, in uh, Second Corinthians chapter two, verses 18, Paul is describing a changed person, a person being transformed from glory to glory. Picture a stepladder. As you step, as you step up each rung, you get closer to the top. As we read our Bibles, as we pray, as we tend church, we grow. Yesterday in our walk with the Lord is not the same as today. Tomorrow will be even more glorious as we learn to grow even more. The hope is that as we learn more, we'll apply God's principles into our lives. For some of us, growing takes longer. But we continue to grow in Christ from one glory to the next. So again, sanctification is God, separate, God separates us from the world. He then changes us for the better. We become more like Jesus and less like our old self, our old self with our fallen nature. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. We just thank the Lord daily for his love, for his renewing, and for him changing our hearts and our minds. With that as an introduction, let's look at tonight's passage. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. As the Holy Spirit changes us from glory to glory, we are more prone to imitate God. We can imitate how he loved. He's our model. He's our, pot, he's our pattern that we should follow. We have the privilege of being his children. So we want to represent him well in this world, in all areas of our life. In our jobs, we can imitate God. We can love on our bosses and fellow employees. We can do our best. We work the hardest. We can start to plant seeds of hope by the way that we work. We want to be different. We want our behavior to make a difference. First Peter chapter one verses nine says, "But ye are chosen, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a peculiar people." The, per, the word peculiar means that we're different, unusual, and even strange. And yes, we are. We should be. We're swimming against the currents of the world. The world system that rejects Jesus. We can either react the same way the world treats us by refusing to share the good God's love with them, or we can do the right thing and love on them, even while they reject us and the Lord. We know Jesus is the only way to salvation. Our co-workers need him. Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 24 tells the slaves, Obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you are working for the Lord rather than working for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. We display 
love when we do our best at our jobs. We're really working for the Lord. Our actions and our attitude make a big difference. Our prayer and hope is for the salvation, the salvation of our co-workers and our friends. What about our homes and our families? We can imitate Jesus there. Again, we're born again. We can't wait to tell others about Christ. At our next family gathering, we get persecuted for sharing Jesus. Our families now separate themselves from us. They don't want to hear about the gospel. They're not one of those, you're not one of those born again Christians, are you? So we keep praying for them and we keep going to family functions. We imitate him by our example of love, even while your family scorns you and your new life. I have to admit, I was so on fire when I came to the Lord, and I still am. As a new believer at a family function, I boldly spoke and shared Jesus with my, I boldly shared Jesus and my faith with my family. They were, uh, they were unresponsive and I felt rejected. They were waiting for the old me. They were waiting for me to get this party started. It was different being around family now. In my BC days before I got saved, I was the life of the party. Alcohol was flowing, tongues were moving. Family topics followed in this order. First sports, then politics, then nonsense. I always ended the night by talking about God, a topic I had no clue about. I did believe in God, but I didn't know him. Today, I know Jesus and I love him very much. I have to confess my error. I stayed away from my family for a while. This is the family that I love and I was hurt. But today, I'm back, I'm back visiting family again. My mom, before she passed away in 2018, she came to church with my sister. They sat right there. I was shocked and surprised. They saw and heard me lead worship for the first time here. They had never seen me play guitar or sing before. The look on my mom's face spoke volumes to my heart. She saw her alcoholic son in church with a new attitude. She saw her son with a heart for God and that he was now leading God's people in singing and praising. My mom was raised in Tokelau, a small group of coral islands north of Samoa. The oceans there are still crystal blue. You ever get a chance to go to Google Maps and look for Tokelau? It's a beautiful set of islands, small coral atolls. They still fish with canoes, <laughs> but they have motors on them. In Tokelau, Everyone went to church on Sundays. Some of, my mom's, some of my mom's family in Tokelau, they were missionaries. She shared, a, she shared a story with me of relatives who went to New Guinea. And while they were there in New Guinea, New Guinea, they were killed for sharing their faith. Our family never went to church growing up. I never went to church growing up. I never stepped into a church growing, growing up. But here's my mom in Calvary Chapel, Kaneohe, hearing God's word again. When she passed, I spoke, I spoke at her memorial in our family yard, which is right up here in Kahalu. So don't ever give up on family, amen? amen. Your heart loves them and wants them saved. Continue to pray for a breakthrough. I know that many of you have, have, have seen victory some or maybe many in your family have come to Christ. I thank the Lord for your blessing. First Corinthians chapter 13 verses one says, if I could speak in all languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. First Corinthians 13, 13 says, three things that last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. If I stand up here and teach God's word to you, and I do not have love for God or others, I don't even be making a noise. I don't want to make noise when I'm speaking of Jesus, my Savior. 
Jesus delivered me from such an awful life. I'm so thankful and grateful what he's, for what he's done for me. I want to imitate him. I want to imitate the way that he loved others. Jesus told us to love God and love others. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord God, your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Like many of you, I want to imitate and represent Jesus well. I never forget what God has done for me, how his son Jesus willingly went to the cross. I thank the Lord daily. I have... Uh, my favorite place to do devotionals is here in um, Temple Valley, the mortuary, the graveyard. And I go there every day. And I go to that place where that, uh, you guys know where the cross is up on the hill? Well, that's where I spend every morning. And I go and talk to the Lord. And I thank him every day for what he's done in my life and for what he's done here at Calvary Chapel, Kanyoi, and for what he's doing around the world in drawing people to him. I never forget the muck and the mire that I came from. I lived in that for too long. I want to represent God well in my daily walk. I know that you as Christians that are here and you love the Lord, I know that you feel the same way. As we continue in our study, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 7 tells us, that there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you, such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, they're not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Verse 5, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of the world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in these things that these people do. So the opposite of wanting to imitate Jesus is being a bad witness for him. So many proclaim to be Christians in this world. Their lives and their actions speak differently. They think it's so. They think it's okay. But they don't know God's word. But God says in verse 3, don't let these sins be amongst you. God instructed Paul to write also in verse 3, such sins have no place amongst God's people. Let us take a look at them. Sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscene storytelling, foolish talk, bad jokes. Verse 5 says that no one living an immoral, impure, greedy life will make it to heaven. If you're saved, you're heaven bound, you're rapture ready. You're sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we are stamped with God's seal. No one can take that seal away from us. This inheritance that we possess, it's heaven. Like you, I'm constantly praying for the unsaved. I hope that at some point they would repent. You know, I love that word repent. It simply means to top, stop running from God, to turn and to change the direction, start running towards him, the result is always a blessing. Jesus, speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. He also mentioned the wind that you can't see. Like palm trees or giant oak trees swaying, you see the effects of the wind, but you can't see the wind. The wind Jesus alludes to is the Holy Spirit. You don't see the Holy Spirit as he enters a human life. But you see the changes that the Holy Spirit makes. The new believer's life changes drastically. He runs from that old life. 
He's a different person. He doesn't want to hurt the heart of God. He wants to start to please God. If someone says to you he loves God but lives a life contrary to how he should, God knows and God sees. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23, Not everyone who calls on, out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name, and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who break God's laws. No true believer will ever be perfect. We scarcely see sins. Uh, we scarcely see true Christians sin. Or we can't see the thoughts that are in their minds. You can't see the thoughts in my mind, and I can't see the thoughts in yours. Our thoughts are not always pure. This side of heaven. We will, never rid, we will never rid ourselves of our sin nature. I remember what Pastor Chuck always said, when you see, when you see sin coming, run. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24 says, since you, have learned, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your, your former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Paul the Apostle, who wrote one-third of the New Testament, yet there's some sin that Paul had struggled with all his life. He describes it to us in the book of Romans, chapter 7. He doesn't say what that sin was, <clears throat> but he does tell us that as long as we live in these bodies, sin will be an issue. And so this is what Paul shares about himself and the struggles that he went through. And this is Romans chapter 7. And we start in verse 14 through chapter 8, verse 1. He says, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, Paul says, for I am to all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for what I want to do, or I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what, that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree the law is good. So I'm not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I want to do what is wrong. I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what, it, but if I, do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin. Live in me, living in me that does it. I have discovered this one principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, Paul says, but there is another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin, this sin that's still in me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life? This life dominated by sin and death. Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is? In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. Then in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, now there, So now therefore there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. The word condemnation means to pronounce to be guilty to sentence punishment. For the Christian, there is no condemnation. The blood of Christ cleanses us of all our sins. If you're not a believer, then condemnation awaits you. In other words, if, you're, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're in trouble. 
Again, in Ephesians 5, 6, Paul says, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sin. 1 John 1, 10 tells us, if we claim that we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 7, he says, don't participate in the sins that these people do. John 3, 17 to 21 tells us, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that what they are doing is what God wants. We know that scripture in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So those who reject God's salvation, the result is condemnation. And we know that without salvation, it doesn't end well for you. Hell for eternity is the result. The Lord's heart is not is that the Lord's heart is that no one would perish. God loves us, but he will never force his will on us. He has always offered mankind a choice. For Christians, we are eternally saved. But as Paul shows us, we still have this sin nature. We're forgiven when we confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9 tells us, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. God doesn't want us to sin. We see that in the next chapter of 1 John, chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Jesus says he doesn't want us to sin. But when we do, he's our advocate. He's our lawyer. He comes to our defense. For, he died for us. And he gave his life for us so that we could be forgiven. In the previous chapter, Ephesians chapter 40, verses 30 to 32, Paul says, And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing you that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. One of my favorite verses of scriptures is Hebrew 12, verses one and two. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great crowd of wit witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run the race with endurance, the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who, who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is sitting in the place of honor beside God's throne. The writer of Hebrews, he says a lot of people watch us as Christians. There are two things they want to know. Is Christianity real and does it work? People are looking for hope, especially with COVID. Some look for hope in people of faith. Someone who shines the light of Jesus. Someone who lives his life with integrity and with the character Hebrews tells us to lay aside every petty, selfish desire, the desire that wars in us. It trips us up in front of people's eyes. 
We become bad witnesses. They may even view us as hypocrites. They don't see anything different from us. We look like the rest of the world. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. You don't have what you don't, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. I pray that we would strip off all, our, all of our selfishness and that, and that we would emulate Jesus and represent him well. Just as Jesus gave his life as a sacrifice, I pray we sacrifice and we give up our selfishness. If you want to imitate the Lord, let us live a life of sacrifice. Let us imitate him by dying to ourselves, die to our selfish desires, so that people will see that there is hope. As we imitate God's love in our character and in our integrity, the hope is that they may see God in us, that there is truth in what Jesus provides that the world might see his light in us, that they may want to, that they would want the same thing for themselves in their lives, that they would give their hearts and their minds to Jesus Christ, and that they would be saved. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14 tells us, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about these things that ungodly people do in secret. But in their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Excuse me. You know, I never want to go back to my old life. It was filled with so much darkness and pain and suffering. That life I thought was so glamorous, it lasted for too long. It only brought sorrow, too many hangovers. In my drunkenness, I had gone and done many shameful things, things that I'm not proud of. I don't even like to talk about them. Too many bad memories. But I do have brothers and sisters in Christ. They were delivered from the same things. We talk. Sometimes we talk about our past. Mostly it's to remind ourselves that we never want to go back. We encourage each other to run from that lifestyle, to thank the Lord for his deliverance. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 tells us, And I will restore the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer, the, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, my life apart from God was so depraved and was so empty. God sent trials to wake me up. I had a DUI back in 1999, and that woke me up. It was not long after that that, that I got saved. But I'm thankful for the Lord for the trials that he brought into my life. And I think many of you here experience the same things. It was a trial that drew you to Jesus. But the Lord has restored much of my life, so much of what the locusts had destroyed. The canker worm and the caterpillar had eaten away. I'm now filled with a lot of joy. Right now I'm nervous because I don't teach much and I'm not used to teaching, but enough of my problems. But my heart is filled with joy when it comes to Jesus. So much optimism, so much hope, I became, a more, I became a mature man when I got saved. I'm a lot better husband today than I was. 
You can talk to Jeannie in the kitchen. She'll tell you all about my story. I've matured in the things of the Lord. I'm also a more patient and a better father. My son, Benjamin, the Lord is doing a great work in his life. He's married to a beautiful wife. They're expecting their first grandchild, my first one. About time, I'm 66 years old. I thank the Lord that his Holy Spirit, that he's helping me to be wiser, to make better choices in my walk with him. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 20, Paul directly by the Lord is warning us. He's also encouraged us to walk in wisdom, to walk by the power of his spirit. He tells us, starting in verse 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of, our, of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs among yourselves. Make music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There was much folly in my old life. Many of you can attest to that because I think there was some folly in your lives as well. We live foolishly, depending on ourselves, trusting in ourselves, leaning on our own understanding. And how did that work out for us? For me, it, it drove me into deeper despair. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 8 says, My child, never forget the things I taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people. And you will learn to earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. Most of your, most of your Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Verse 7 and 8 says, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Going back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul tells us to make the best use of our times as these are evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants us to do. I'm thinking God wants us to pray and that we should let him lead us. Devotionals with the Lord is always a good time. It's a time when we ask, ask him for that which he has for us that day. He is faithful to show us what to do. Then he will send us out. I love that when a group of men from a small Bible study in Kaneohe, they went out and they shared the gospel. They had prayed and the Lord answered. He put it in one of the men's hearts to do an outreach. These men and their families, they meet during the week, Tuesdays and Fridays. The Lord put it on their hearts to do something to share the love of Jesus. Chris, Kimo, Norman, Eric, Lyric, Isaiah, Gabriel, Gabriel Sr., Lonnie, Capono. They did an outreach and they shared the gospel. They went out to a low-income housing project here in Oahu. The Lord Jesus was on full display. They shined his light. They were being obedient to the Lord's call to go into all the world. While at the outreach, they prayed for adults and they prayed for children. They took with them 50 care bags with food and toiletries. They took with them pizza for the kids. They took with them a guitar and they praised the Lord. They sang songs. And most importantly, they took with them the love of Jesus. 
What has the Lord put on your heart to do today? I don't ask this with a convicting spirit. I just speak with love from my heart to yours. Many of you are still serving. Many of you are already serving the Lord. Many of you have a full plate and you're really busy. Family with schooling and work. These are things, these things, they occupy much of your time. And you love what you're doing. You're serving the Lord by caring and loving others. For those of you who are wanting to serve Him and don't know what it is that you should do, take it to the Lord in prayer. He will show you and direct you in His time, in His way, and for His glory. He will direct your path. He may show you His will immediately. He may have you wait. The Lord led Jeannie and I to Calvary Chapel in 2005. We're a small church of 16 people. <laughs> Most of them were Pastor J.D.'s family. On my first Sunday there, I met Pastor J.D. A friend who was attending the church, one of the 16, we were in a Bible study together. So out of all the 16 people there, he knew me. He told Pastor J.D. that I was learning how to play guitar. Jeannie and I, we just simply started helping. We started opening a church, making coffee. There was a husband and wife leading worship at the time. It was different, but it was worship. We were praising God. In his wisdom, Pastor J.D., he waited. He waited to see. He waited for about six months before he asked if I would pray about leading worship. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Paul is, Paul is admonishing Timothy to be careful when selecting leaders in the church. Someone might be a really talented singer. Someone might be a really talented, really knowledgeable with scripture. Someone may be impressive as an orator and a teacher, unlike me. But wait on the Lord. He will show you a man's character, faithfulness, and integrity. Pastor J.D. did that with me, and he waited. I led worship here at Calvary Chapel, Kanyoe, for 17 years. Now the Lord has called me to serve him in another capacity as an assistant pastor. <laughs> I was going to raise this, but I'm glad I didn't. I don't enjoy teaching from the pulpit, but God. Amen. Amen. I enjoy and I like helping others. I'm in charge of the, uh, the ministry of helps here. Benevolence ministry. And if anybody needs anything, you need help, you come see me and I'll take care of you. The Holy Spirit will take care of you. God will take care of you. And he'll use me. Amen. There are a lot of needs here in this church, here in Calvary Chapel, Kanyoe. But we have a staff who really loves the Lord. We have a staff that really loves each other. We work well together. We are so blessed to have been taught by the Lord in how to walk with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Why, don't, why don't we stand and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word, Lord. We know that, as Pastor J.D. said, if you, can do it, you, if you can use a donkey like him, you can use a donkey like me. I'm just so thankful, Lord, for your love and your kindness and how you've drawn each and every one of us here in this room, and for those of you online, to you, how your mercy and grace, Lord, has been poured out in our lives, and how so good you are to us. Your word tells us to be still and know that you are God. Your word tells us if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked, wicked ways and seek my face. And I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin 
and I'll hear their land. So that's my prayer for those who are watching online. And maybe someone here today doesn't, who doesn't know you or has been coming to church and hasn't really surrendered their heart to you. That's my prayer for them, Lord. I don't need to lead them in a prayer. They just need to call out to you and ask you to come in. And you will. So I thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made. This time that we can fellowship together. And this time that we learn of you. And this time we can love you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.